The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. It's the Brandon Maggard episode of the Paul Leslie Hour. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by an all-around storyteller. Brandon Maggard is an actor, writer, poet, author, painter. As an actor, he's worked on television, in film, and on Broadway. As a book author, he writes the Papa's Footprint series. So, Brandon Maggard, thank you very much for making the time to speak with us. It's an honor to have you on. Well, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to, to speak to you. Uh, during these times of uh, solitude, quarantine here, uh, everybody's kind of keeping me in touch with uh, with uh, radio, your, like your radio show and uh, Facebook and, and all that stuff. So we've been keeping in touch. Uh, like on Facebook, uh, you hear from people that you, you grew up with you hadn't heard of in 40, 50 years. And so it's, a, it's a really, of, of all the terrible things that have happened, this communion of times past and present is salvageable and, and, and important and valuable. Absolutely. Well spoken. So I put all these labels on you. I said that you're an actor, you're a writer, you're a painter. Is there a certain label that you identify most with? Well, I tell you, the, I, I I don't think you can say a label, I, except I, I think I've mentioned before, I'm what I am is an old man. And old people that have lived this, I'm 86, and if you've lived this long and you've paid attention, like you, if you've looked around and not just uh, look straight ahead, if you look around and see what's going on around you and what you get through and what your ups and downs and whatever, you you learn a lot. No, I have seven children, two mothers of the seven children, so I've been around. And in show business, I've been around. As you say, I've been a painter. I painted for a specific reason one time. It was to get over the loss of one of my children. My daughter, Justine, was killed in a car crash in 1985, and I was just in a terrible state. And to I was doing a, actually lucky enough. I was doing a, a t- TV show, which was a comedy at the time called Brothers on Showtime. And but I, I went, I came, I went back to Connecticut to where she, the accident was and her funeral. And I came back, and I, I was so little to no use on the show. I kept breaking down, crying, and and uh, during note sessions, uh, they would take notes and whatever. And I noticed I started doodling and. I, started doodling a, 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 for some reason like a sketch of a, a, of a joke that my mother had told me when I was like 12 years old I said, <laughs> and I kind of giggled myself and went how did that pop in there well that kind of led to something else I ended up uh, going home and sketching a lot of stuff and make and I uh, did like you know, nearly 90 paintings I did and it the point of that was to salvage with humor, I took that joke, which was funny, and which was a little off color for a mother to be telling a 12 year old son about an old bull and a young bull looking down on the valley at the young, <laughs> at the young uh, heifers down there. And the young bull said, Let's go down there and have us one. And old bull, bull said, No, we'll walk down and have them all. <laughs> so, so, I, I, so I did a painting of that and a lot of other. So, so I have there all over my house, and I have three floors. Uh, uh, those paintings, and I did that all those in about a ten years uh, stretch. And I was on the Art Walk. People used to come in and out. We'd raise money for the Venice Clinic, and people coming in and out. And I would tell stories and look at them. And the point was to, to do it like a on one like like on one cell if you're to a, a film or something on on, the, on a canvas. Uh, uh, what to paint would imply a story that you might have heard years ago. So if, if I put that that picture of the old bull and the young bull up on there, looking down all these cattle, so people look then and they look at that and say nothing. And I say, well, well, this reminded me. And then I put put a have another up there, and they say, oh, that reminds me of a story that I heard about uh, in the Second World War. This old guy said about 
Oh yeah, the, uh, the the there's an airplane crash down on on a desert island in the South Pacific there, and there like weren't there like four uh, people that the captain, the co-captain, and the gunner, and then I navigated, and they're all gathered around, and they've they've eaten all their food there, and they got down to one piece of cheese. And and they said, well, we look at one piece of cheese is not going to do anybody any good. Said, here's what we'll do: we'll 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 go to sleep and we'll have a we'll dream and we'll wake up and tell our dreams. And one that that has the best dream gets to eat the last piece of cheese. Okay, so they all go to sleep, and they wake up the next day, and one tells his story. Oh, wow, I, I had the greatest dream. I woke up, and it was Thanksgiving. There was turkey and blah, blah, blah. The other guy, and I woke up, and my mother and dad were there, and we sang songs. And the other guy said, I woke up, and blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> the last guy said, of course, back then you told jokes about Jewish or Irish. or, or You made some sort of ethnic or religious point about each thing. And the last guy, I'm going to go, he he said, "Oh, says, well, I hate to tell you, I dreamed all you guys died and went to heaven, so I got up and ate the cheese. <laughs> so, so I painted that. <laughs> and anyway, the the whole point in all of this is humor. And now, to humor uh, uh, is always uh, laughter. Humor, laughter is a a saving grace uh, that uh, that saves us all." No, I don't know. Can I get lost there somewhere? I don't know. No, no, no. I think you brought up a good point. And, you know, during this time of everybody being stuck inside and not able to move about, not able to travel, you know, I, I can't, I don't think that you could put a dollar value on humor. No, not at all. Yeah. And we miss, it. and people are coming up with various ways now, are scuffling around. Like, as you mentioned before, I've written a lot of books, and I have a new one coming out. We'll talk about probably later. But um, people are coming out about, well, I, should I read part of my book and in installments on the thing to promote it, get people interested? I don't know. So, it, it, I, my book, books before were just print, but I have, anyway, I have a number of fans, and they said, well, uh, Brandon, you you should. Uh, should uh, uh, with your own voice tell tell the story of of one on uh, on Audible. Uh, uh, Amazon has a branch called Audible, and uh, I mean probably are books. You know, you can listen to, listen to Audible books. I don't, do you listen to books? Uh, I don't yeah, know. yeah. Sometimes I do. Yeah, well, they they're good. So I said, um. Oh. Well, that sounds like a really good idea. So they, they said, well, look, so you can look in Audible, and they have the books lined up. And you say, they sample. So, oh, I like that book. Let me see. I, I play, it's like a two-minute, somewhere around two-minute sample every time of an author. And it can, might be actor, actors, or whatever, or it could be the author or, or herself or himself. And so I, I went to school on that. I started playing the, just the samples. And some of them have, having already read the books, and I said, hmm, I, I either liked the way that one did or I didn't like it or, oh, my God, how do, you know, some of them are just awful. And some of them are so presentational and some of them, like they had the first time they were reading it. <laughs> I don't, but some of them are, are really good, so I've gathered some of those. So I decided to, along with my, my daughter, Maud, told me, said, Dad, just tell to, to read your book like you're just reading it to, you know, five or six of your friends gathered around the kitchen table, just one, like one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Just well, just like I'm talking to you now, t telling a story about. Well, I walked down the street and the, and the clouds opened up there, and all of a sudden a hail storm came down. <laughs> I thought I was going to die. The bouncing off, you know, that kind of thing. That way to tell the story, and, and so that that's how I've been doing this book. I've just finished recording it. It has a little music in it, not much. But recording it, and it's on, on print, and will be on Audible, too, in, in a very short time. And uh, it's called Where, Where Possums Dance and the Wise... Where Possums Dance and the Willow Sings. So you can tell by that, it's got a kind of homespun quality to it, too. <laughs> Uh, possums dancing, which came, possum dancing came off a story like I tell about my grandpa told me, or my great grandpa told me, and where the willow sings comes out of a thing when I was a teenager, and I was 
in, in, in any kind of distress or angst, I would go down by the river at Cumberland River and, and, and fish. And mostly it was just to relax and let my troubles go by like the current of the river going by. Just turn it over to the river, give it to the river, give it to the river, and watch it go on by. So that's a part of where the title is uh, in in the book, <laughs> how it came about. Uh, okay, where where did I go off the track there? Well, I was just noticing how how rich your speaking voice is. Well, you know, as you mentioned, I've uh, my whole life I've been on the stage, and, and uh, I started out in a small town, and and you know, just to sing in church in a Methodist church. I oh, I know where I jumped off the track. Methodist church in a small town. Is and I've been in touch with the my local paper there. It's the Carthage Courier. And I've, I've had it. You know, when I was growing up there, it was there with changed hands several times. But I kept in touch. I mean, it delivered, and then it years later it became a digital thing. So I've kept up with the. I still have relatives that live there, but I've kept up with it. And some of the things that have come up, I, I don't know if I, they. I object to things that are happening in the world today, and I wrote what I thought to the having printed, and they printed a little bit of something. They said, "Well, so, you know, we we can't print political things." And I said, "Well, it has to do with me growing up really in, in the church and and being raised with you know love our neighbors as myself." And and I said, "So I don't understand why people are condoning what's happening on the border down there." So I wrote all this stuff like that, and they printed one, and oh, the people liked it. And then I send another one, and the guy, the editor, said, "I don't think we should take this any further." Said, you know why? Because in a small town, a small paper, they they have such a hard time staying alive anyway. So if you it's so, same thing in the church. If the if the if the preacher in the church gets up and takes a stand, there's a chance that that preacher might lose half the congregation, and it takes the whole congregation to to keep the church a church afloat or the paper afloat. So you have to walk a a fine line about kind of sneaking in what you think is right. Or in the paper, usually it's like who won the football game, who's on the, who, who's on the honor roll at school, and who had a picnic and all that stuff. So, but in 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 church, uh, I'm in touch with the local pastor there at Methodist Church, and she is really doing a great job. But she has to, and of course now with the with the uh, with the uh, uh, the plague that's going on now, and in the isolation, she has has to come up with a new way to deliver her sermon out some way to deliver it out to her congregation. So anyway, that's what I wanted to say. That I realized when I was in the small town that I couldn't really speak out because if I said what I really wanted to say. And my dad was in the car business, and he sold Chevrolet cars. And if I said something would be be offensive to people who bought the Chevrolet cars, like a bunch of them wouldn't buy it. Maybe some, maybe some on the other side might buy two. But in other words, it's a small pot to stir. So that and being able to sing and being acting and so forth, uh, I knew that I'd have more artistic freedom to be myself and write myself and and expose myself as uh, with uh, authentically myself if I, I went to where uh, uh, the other, other people gathered, like on the New York stage is where I, I, I migrated after college. I, I, I won some awards in, in college and uh, scholarships, and I was going to be on I wanted to sing at the Met, but I ended up on Broadway for a while at our, our waiting on tables. You know that story. I said, oh, I'm going to. I told my wife at the time, you already had a little baby girl. I said, okay. I said, it's going to take me at least two weeks to get a Broadway show. Well, I didn't get a Broadway show for several years later, and it opened and closed in one night. <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> anyway, that's that's the venue I, I took, and I I'm glad I did because I can now, when I write my books and everything, I can say exactly what I want to say. If you don't like it, don't read it. If you don't, you know, people that, oh, this book is about this. And uh, uh, at some point, I'd like to, I had to put it, I put in a disclaimer in the first paragraph of the, uh, 
uh, of the book to let you know that, well, it, you, know, you might not be interested in the book unless you kind of identify with this. At some point, I'd like to read it, read it to you. Absolutely. You can pick, okay, it says, all right, I see. Now, if you've enjoyed Johann Sebastian Bach and Walt Whitman, laughed at Moms Mabley, Dorothy Parker, Robert Benchley, Yogi Berra, George Carlin, the seven words you can't say on television, and Mark Twain, the jumping frog of Calaveras County, swept away by Gershwin, Puccini, W.C. Handy, Julie Stein, and the words and music by Stephen Sondheim, been fascinated by the mind and personality of Nikola Tesla, the voice and abandon of Maria Callas, transported, transported by Miguel de Cervantes, enter into my imagination. Enthralled with William Blake in seeing a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, bedazzled by the words and, uh, and worlds of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's A Hundred Years of Solitude, found resonance with Vincent van Gogh, Salvador Dali, Henri Matisse, Edward Hopper, the loneliness of its nighthawks there, oh my goodness, uh, uh, are open to the concept of non-local connections. You might come to live with me in Where Possums Dance and the Willow Sings, the full title of which is To Soar Aloft on Butterfly Wings, Where Possums Dance and the Willow Sings, off to the near side of the moon to see himself, who I believe to be me. Okay, so if, if they can look at that and they say, I don't think so, or they might say, well, this guy's going where I'd like to go. <laughs> you know, so I, 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 I figure I better put that up front because I do take off and I write about so many different things and my mind goes to places about creation and what is creation? I don't know if you know. One of the things stuck in my mind is Stephen Sondheim. It says there's a song called "The Hat" about creating. Mm-hmm. What is it? A, a hat where there never was a hat, where there, where there never was before a hat, something like that. So creation, we consider creation down the line. We're we're in God's image. And he created this. He created us to create. So down and 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 I say that God has made some terrible blunders, and we are in His image, so we make some terrible blunders. So, but we try to improve us, one step at a time, uh, mistakes and, and, and adjustments, and all with the purpose of coming to, but probably never will become uh, to perfection. Like we can't, I don't get too too, but. You, you, the scientists say, well, you can't square the circle. So what's up with that? <laughs> you know, there's certain areas and things that, that are open, which you might say, well, that's, that's, that's where God left the area where you, you should have faith. So as you can tell, I go into some, some cracks and crevices in my mind. And also I go into all this, a lot, many of these stories and, and the debaucheries I've been involved in with. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've been, well, uh, the, Diane, the, the mother of my last two youngest daughters, one time she, she said she was really angry at me. I, I, I must say that at one time I was a drunk. I've been sober for 40 years old, not a single drink, and, and for, for, for for the last 40 years. But uh, at one point she was yelling at me. And she said, "Come me, you second-rate Lothario," <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, and, and I laughed, and she laughed. And it was really good. She nailed me. She said, well, that was that was great. And then well, we laughed. And then, as I say, after that, it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> so, in other words, I have I put, I tell the truth about myself, and that's what I, it's very hard to do, to be authentic. I'm, I digress here, but my youngest daughter, as you know, Fiona Apple, just and she is the epitome of, of authenticity. She tells her, goes into her soul, into her bottom, and as like I say in my book, it's an archaeological dig into my id. And she just 
Poof. And at one point I said, Fiona, I don't, I don't know if I should write this because everybody she said, Dad, don't ever let anybody tell you what to write and what you cannot write as long as it's authentic to you. And so that's what I've done. <laughs> so I learned from my children. They might pick up a few things not to do by by what me, <laughs> but by watching them and and and, uh, and watching my oldest daughter who lives with me now and takes care. She's a nurse, and she wrote something really a scathing thing about the uh, about the well the scene out in in California in the small like the nursing home things and the, and the uh, rehab things where the people are put in, to, they put in this, like a, a Petri dish of people put in there. And if one gets it, everybody's going to get it. Anyway, I'm so proud of her. She's not, hasn't been ever on the, an actress or a singer, but I'm so proud of her. Equally, you know, I, do you have children? I do not have any children, no. Well, you have a lot of listeners who are the, pretty much the same thing. Those are we are we are we are, you know, are your children, so you you have to convey to us what you hear, what you think about, and share with us what what people you select to 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 talk with you about on your show. So you're you're a, a papa of radio. You got that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take All that right. for the rest of my life. <laughs> Well, that's it. You're responsible. You're presenting things, and you let people. T- you let me talk. God knows how many people have said, "I don't want to hear that." That guy's outrageous. I don't want to hear that. But so far, I'm still on the air. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so okay, I uh, have run aground here. So put me back on track. Well, you know, you mentioning the newspaper there, it made me think about about your background the University of Tennessee School of Journalism, which right. I, I've been by there. And I'm curious to know, what did learning about journalism do for your life? Okay, this is going to be a kind of, I guess you can guess, a circuitous route. I, I'd gone to Swan at University, University of the South my freshman year and I played football there and I kept getting knocked out. So I said, this is not for me. I had three concussions, and so I transferred to UT. And, and uh, what was available to me? I went, uh, I could sing, and I could act, and and the nearest thing I said, well, journalism. It's writing about presenting things. So I, I looked at the what's available. Oh yeah, they, on this well, drama, <laughs> they had listed, and music. So I, I jumped into that. So what I got out of it was, and they had the, the a radio show. Uh, that so I, I I got used I got on that s- several times where was mostly played classical music and learned how to present that. There, there was also there was a local TV show that I was on several times where we where we sang and just just like a local talent thing really, <laughs> like if it was St. Patrick's Day, and it was live back then, and that was one, and so. You know, you're in college, you're studying, you're asking, oh, yeah, you've got to go back on Friday night. Well, what's it about? Is it going to sing songs about St. Patrick's Day? Oh, well, let me see. Well, I, I can sing St. Uh, McNamara's band. That's good. And so we got on the had kind of a, a rehearsal. But we're not say, you're going to sing this? Oh, yeah, we're going to sing that. All right, but then we're going to cut. And so I started singing McNamara's band. Are you familiar with that song, the old Irish song? Ah, mm-hmm. uh, the Hennessy, Tennessee, Toodles, the flute, and the music was something grand. And right away I started, I lost the lyric. And this is live television. This is part of my journalism experience. See? <laughs> live television. And a Hennessy, Tennessee. Now get back on. Oh, the drums, they're banging, the cymbals clang, and the horns, they blaze away. And you get upon the deedles. I mean, <laughs> and then when I, I could say, and I could see it, look in the corner of my eye, and I'd see the guy in the control room, like scratching his head, looking, shaking his head. I didn't know what it was live. So I kept doing like Sid Caesar double talk through the whole thing. Finished the song. Went on. Next next week, I was walking down the street. And one guy said, "Hey, that was a funny. What was that? Was an unusual version of the Magnolia Man." I said, "Yeah, because I forgot the lyrics and I was just double talk singing." <laughs> anyway, so I did that. I did very little actual journalism because I did mostly the theater there. I did oh several plays. John Cullum was there at the same time. 
we did plays together at a theater in the round, the Carousel Theater, and, and another theater downtown in the old, old theater house there. And I did operas with the with the uh, uh, Knoxville Symphony. Yeah, I did. I, did, I played the old man Germain in Traviata, in in one performance uh, there, and, and Deflator Mouse I did. And actually, then I, I won. This is how I kind of said, "Okay, I, I think I will go to New York." Uh, it's I, I, they have a contest in Tennessee every year. I, I guess they still do it. The the, uh, the professional singers have a contest every two years, and uh, who wins? It's a Grace Moore scholarship, and uh, and I won it, and I won a scholarship to take my studies to New York. I said, well, and I, I said, I, this is the end of the Korean War, and I was in the Air Force ROTs. I was going to go in as a pilot. But then at the end of the war, I'd, uh, they gave us another test, and I flunked the eye test, and they didn't need more pilots, so they wouldn't, they, they couldn't use me as a pilot. So they said I could go in as an officer, or, or, or what? And they said, well, right, you can just walk away. So that's I, I left, went to New York. As you can see, I do in my telling you stories. You're, you're a genius if you can get me back on track. <laughs> you're right on schedule. What about your first time performing? Can you tell us what that experience was like the first time you stepped on a stage? Were you nervous? What was that like for you? Okay, okay, I can tell you exactly. The first time I sang in public was in my local church, in the Carthage United Methodist Episcopal Church, that's called now, and I sang the Lord's Prayer. And... Uh, and, you know, people knew love to hear me sing. As a matter of fact, I, I wouldn't talk too much on dates. I would sing. If I ran out of things to say, I, I would sing to my dates. <laughs> so I was kind of a kook back then, and still am. But I sang the Lord's Prayer, and when I got to sing, Our Father, boom, boom, my heart, my heart was shaking my nose, which art in heaven. So that was how nervous I was. Hmm. But then I, after a while I got over and people say, whoa, that, that was so wonderful. Never heard anything like that in the church. That was really great. And uh, and so it made me feel good. And I, I'd made the church people people feel good and my mom and dad. And so I got over that kind of that. But I've always been nervous, which is good. Even Pavarotti he had, he was more nervous than I was. He used to, of course, he had a, he had a higher standard to come up to every time, uh, and uh, but most almost all performers get nervous. They put it in, energy goes into your energy bank, and all of a sudden you get out there and you hit the lights. You're on stage, and all of a sudden you're focused. You're focused, and you become the singer, the the actor telling telling the story, or, or whatever. But you need energy. Like if you're a baseball player, football player, or whatever you do. Uh, or a chess player, you, you know, you, you you got your inner, your concentration, you're stored up in there. But that was the first time, and uh, it was memorable, as you can tell. <laughs> my heart, my my heart, making my notes waver, boom, 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 like that. You know, I like it when the guest is uninhibited and relaxed enough that they sing, and you've sung twice, so you. It's clear that you're a musical person, that music very much resonates with you. Well, if you call that singing, that's sort of right. But that's, that's a, a matter of fact, I do sing on, on my Audible book, but I sing as the old man, which I am. I sing at one point, I am a poor wayfaring stranger, you know that old song? Which was which is apt because it's setting a thing in the eighteen eighteen fifties uh, and sixties seventies eighties when when my character my character has gone from Tennessee on the during the gold rush time out and on the on, from he goes from Santa Fe up all the way to the to the California to find gold and he of course he, all the people that went west they were were in shock about what the trip was like with cholera and 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 robbing people and it, just terrible things happening. So when he sings, when my character sings that at this time, he's about at the end of his, uh, uh, 
No more, no more, no more, no more, no more will I roam. So it's so to put him out there. You can imagine him out on the, in the desert looking up at the stars when he converses with his, when he's intended back home and he, he talks to her, imagining that she's looking up at the same heavens he's looking up and he's he's out here, nobody around at this time except a rattlesnake over there and a coyote hunting over here and, 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 and he imagines himself singing and bouncing off the moon, the full moon, his words coming down to his girl, Kate on the front porch swing in Tennessee. So anyway, that's 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 a different kind of performing, like on like on Broadway stage or an opera. It's, it's conversational, but in in with a melodic line and the intent of the song. But that's really the only kind of singing I do, and a little little different, a few songs. Okay, I'm that's joined it. by author and artist Brandon Maggard. Brandon, are artists born or made? You know, everybody that Zen kind of wonders wonders about that. I think you're 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 a fertile ground, and you have to. Uh, you you. It's when I wrote my first book, a friend of mine read it and said, "Oh, you should put it in a drawer, and look at it some other time. Let it lie fallow." So, and I did, and and it. Uh, Nurse itself, and anyway, it became you know six books. But if you have, I I can remember like the first time I said, oh, I want yeah. I was really loved books when I was little, and uh, I loved reading about horses and Black Beauty. I remember I wrote so I wrote I remember writing a little story. I said I got I had this pony or a colt out in the barn in the pound there, running around and kicking whatever and jumping a fence, and then. I said, well, what do I do after he jumps a fence? I have no idea. I haven't lived long enough to to know yet. So that's what's happened my whole life. I've after I jumped the fence, I've continued on and and learning and coming to you know what the what I've run into along the way, what I what I've been knocked down by, what I've gotten up by, and and all that stuff. So you have that seed in the beginning of looking around and seeing what's this like, what's this world, what's it all about, and what's, what do I have a position in this world, a place, a rightful place that's mine, authentically mine, and how do I nourish this? I don't want to present myself in telling you things I don't know and having to say, but anyway, that I got to be 86, and I, I, people ask me, well, it must be awful to be that old. And I say, this is the happiest time in my life the last, like, 10 years. Hmm. Because I've had, I've had, you know, with a large family, and I've had to scuffle going from this show to that show or to being out of work. Or Years ago, I had to be, when I was winning awards and off times, I had to be a waiter in a club. <laughs> so if you had to scuffle, everybody has to scuffle in life. But once you hit a point, and like I say, I've saved my pennies. So I don't have to, and my kids are all grown and stuff. I help them when I can, but I have a place to live, and I have this. So I've had 10 years. I've had, okay, now I'm presented. As a matter of every night when I go to sleep, right before I go to sleep, I say thank you out loud. Now, I'm, not still, I'm not a religious person, but I have, I'm in touch. I say thank you out loud and uh, because it or the universe or God or what, whatever, uh, I've, I'm in touch with that, without uh, without somebody, a different various religions and beliefs and do's and don'ts or whatever. I take, God gave me a mind, and uh, and uh, I, I appreciate that and value that, and I, I bounce off him or her. <laughs> so I say in my book, well, maybe it's a she, I say so now, uh, my mother, which art in heaven, <laughs> because it, you know God may have worn himself out a little bit, and he may need to turn it over to Mrs. God for a while, because the women, the female, we need a female touch at this present time. Now I know I digress, but that's where it takes me there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know it occurs to me you're a man who's written hundreds and hundreds of pages. Why do you write? Oh. 
Oh, my goodness. Hundreds and hundreds. Yeah, well, as you know, the trilogy, I wrote Pablo's Footprint Trilogy, and I rewrite, I rewrite, I rewrite. Many writers who you rewrite and rewrite. I, I did, well, you know, with uh, Walt Whitman, who wrote Leaves of Grass so many times. And uh, it's like people, say, some writers say, oh, it's so painful. Oh, my God. But with me, we'll wake up in the morning, it's like, oh, boy, I open, I open the floodgates, and here I come pouring out. And this leads into that and that leads into this and this is over there and I go back to that then I go back to this and come up again it's shaping and I pull this out and that out and then people hear it they like it they identify with it and so I'm passing I'm, ex- I'm exposing myself but there are people out there that do you think you're unique not really there's some people out there, uh, I have some, one, one of my fans over there said, I wish I could write like that. I said, well, you, you understand what I write, so we're participating in this together. I just happen to be, you dance better than I do, but, but uh, I happen to be putting into words that you have stored inside you there somewhere, and they, they come to surface and you identify with them. So <laughs> there I go off again. That that was a very interesting perspective. I I really appreciate that. So, how do you define a successful artist? Oh, well, you want to take Vincent Van Gogh, sold one painting, hmm. <laughs> starved, did or did not shoot himself, or maybe that kid shot him in, in, at, with the crows flying around. He was pained and everything, but what he put on paper, on on canvas, people identify with it. He's gone. He never made it. And within this past year, it's like, no, it may be within the past five or six years, one of his paintings sold for uh, an enormous amount of money, which, uh, you know, like a billion dollars, I don't know, some enormous amount of money. It, but he never saw, he never made it, you know, a, a dime or so one little painting or something. I don't know if he sold it to his brother or, or what. But you just what makes an artist is you do your work. He wrote, he painted what was what he saw, what was in his mind. And if people want to identify with it at the time or poo poo in it because it, it's not in step with the classical, what's going on now, he didn't let that bother him. He painted what he saw. And so if you look at painters, the unique painters, some of them, are, oh, my gosh, I, I have no idea what they're doing. And people say, well, I don't know what it's all about, but I, I like it to look at it. That's some of that, too. But there's sometimes you can boing, you can see, like I mentioned, uh, uh, Edward Hopper's uh, Nighthawks, uh, contemporary, you know, he's gone now. But painting, and you look at that, the three people in a diner in the early morning hours alone sitting there, and the painting itself, uh, uh, says of the loneliness of people who go into an early morning diner and are there, the guy that runs it and so the waitress are standing there. The stillness of that, the picture of that goes socko. It tells you exactly what's happening then. And the same with photography. When a photographer's catch, catch moments, glimpses, candid shots of invaluable things that are happening. So, again, I go off. So, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody can go to your website. It's brandonmaggart.com. Well, let me let me let me let me let me stop you there. Now, it's, it's there, but it's really outdated. You can go there and see a little bit. There are references there, yeah, but it's it's really out of date. There's some old clips and old things in there. You can go and investigate. Believe me, it's going to be improved once this go back and refurbish it. But, but it is there, brandonmaggart.com. Yeah. That's M A G G A R T. Right. It's it's yeah B R A N D O N M A G G A R T. Uh, I mean uh, 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 dot com. Brand, Brandon Maggart dot com. It says what? It it says actor and author, and I gave I gave all of these different titles to you. But who but that was written. In, 
you know, in a hurry back several years ago. And I just haven't gone back to, to, to redo that thing because I'm constant. I have been constantly on the move and rewriting and improving what I've written and everything. So, it's, again, you could go back through there. Like I say, you could go back through an archaeological dig if you want to. But if you really want to catch up or whatever, and there are a lot of things from those books, stories I tell. Stories I tell in those books, which come out in this book I'm telling, and it makes an, uh, uh, I describe it as a, a fugue. I mentioned uh, 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 Bach. It starts, I'm like I'm a cello part in the beginning of a fugue, and the family and friends and children know for weave in and out to come to, at the end, hopefully to a resolve at the end. Absolutely. So who would you say Brandon Maggart is at heart? I'd say Brandon Maggart is an open heart looking and watching, observing and trying his best like the uh the Hippocratic oath the doctors take to to not harm people to be of use to give people some identification laughter that's that's too long, but you get the essence of what it is. It's it's not fake. It's me. <laughs> uh, authentic. At the end of my shows, I always like to give the guest the stage. And this is totally open-ended. What would you say to anyone tuned in? I would say if you've listened to our conversation and we've held your attention, that's what we set out to do. And... And I've been given the chance to open up here, but uh, sometimes you're not given a chance to to really express yourself. And even now, I've been given the open end here to to say things, which I think I've already done all the way through the show. But I, if if I'm given the open end, I can just say, now you can cut this out if you like to, because uh, if you become political these days, it's it's not. But I I. We're in such terrible trouble. Terrible. I, no, I can't do this because I, I can't because, as I say, I have friends. It's like the war between the states, brother against brother, and uh, up to it's like I, I try to have conversation with 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 Republicans that I know and love, but it's, it's I say it's like two stumps arguing. It's that cognitive dissonance. If one believes a certain thing, and that's what cognitive dissonance is, if you're ingrained with that, if you grew up in that, uh, I grew up on my mother's knee with with uh, whatever, church, uh, Baptist, religion, whatever, in mind, and that's how I am. And I grew up in a, my Republican, and I, it, it, too much government's not a good thing. Or if you grew up the other way, said, I, I grew up more with the church and listened to what Jesus said about sharing and kicking the money lenders out of the, uh, you know, that. So, but you have you have a bridge in between that you can uh, uh, hopefully uh, build a bridge. Bridge. Oh my God! I must try to scroll down to a thing I wrote at the very end. Uh, sorry. I'm, while I'm talking here, I wrote some, something at the very end. I think you should. I'm going to read a poem. It's a counterpoint to to uh, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. But here it is. It's what I wrote. I as you and you as I listen. Observe. Question. Challenge. Weep fully without shame. Laugh to rouse the near dead. Love with every ounce of being. Lust with fire of urgency. Repent. And celebrate as the ever-recurring sun sets in the west with its beauty and reassurance to calm the frightened beast within. We watch from the shoreline as crowds gather alongside to see the splendor and wonder of it. A sinking, a brief flash, the resolute change, until once again, we meet and gather as did our parents and their parents and all who lived before. 
I hereby venture that the only surefire thing in this world is the rising of the sun in the east and the setting of the sun in the west. The evolvement is impressive, but what does it mean? The question is addictive. For sweet balm, harmonies waft unannounced on the autumn breeze to comfort the beleaguered soul. We breathe a brief respite. On the instant, challenges spring as poisonous ivies as energies rise and wane with the tides of experience flailing and confused. We persist. We tell stories. We laugh. (laughs) Oh, God, we laugh. We laugh. We rise and face the coming east. Rivers round bends. Possums dance, and wise willows sing, honeysuckle, and the smell of freshly turned soil. All sing of this, this song of ourselves. Okay, that's about it. That kind of sums it up. Wow, that was was great. You know, when you do it, I'd love to have you send me a copy of what you finally air. Absolutely. Because you've given, you have given me the wonderful time and and space to, to, uh, honestly say you with your questions have been open and given me the space to do it have been invaluable to me and hopefully to your audience and you well thank you for saying that i really appreciate it Goodbye.